Welcome to our Wednesday service for Holy Week. The cross looms even closer and Jesus moves forward only through his dependence on God's faithfulness towards him. His attitude throughout his ordeal is like the servant described by Isaiah, not one of retaliation and rage, but one of non-resistance. Jesus, like the servant he is, can set his face like flint because he had ears to hear God's word to him and is confident, therefore, of God's constant care. Jesus obviously resolved to complete the journey set before him and his strength must have been increased by the great cloud of witnesses that surrounded him, encouraging him to stand firm in the face of such evil. Through his endurance of the shame and agony of the cross, his suffering and death, Jesus joined that cloud of witnesses so that when our road seems long and difficult to endure, we have the confidence to believe that we will not grow weary or lose heart. Let us pray. Lord God, we tremble to think that it was one of Jesus' own friends who betrayed him, one who sat by him, who broke bread with him. Give us strength, we pray, to walk faithfully with Jesus, even when the road we walk is rocky, even when the message of his cross seems like foolishness, and even when we feel betrayed. You, Lord, are always faithful. We stumble, we become lost, but you are steady and sure. Give us the grace to endure our troubles and reveal to us the glory of your kingdom through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'd like to hand over to Reverend Russell Clark to do the sermon for this Wednesday Holy Week. Thanks, Andrew. I want to share with you today from John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 21 to 35. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know what which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to, to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was sending him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus, Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me. And just as I told you, I told the Jews, I tell you now, you cannot go where I am going. A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I grew up as one of four brothers and as four brothers we got into a lot of mischief and sometimes that mischief got us into trouble. Especially when we broke one of Dad's favourite tools or Dad found that some of his money was missing or some neighbour down the road had reported that the Clark boys had done something and I can remember us four boys being lined up and being grilled as to who it was and our first action was to try to absolve ourselves of the blame and pass it on to someone else or at the very least to share the blame with one of the brothers because none of us wanted to carry it. And that seems a natural reaction but here it's a different story because when the, the disciples are told that one of them will betray him they don't say oh well it must be this one or that one 
They're at a loss to know. They look around and they say, who is it? Even uh, in Matthew's Gospel it says, is it me, Lord? And when Judas, even at the time when Judas leaves, they still haven't got a clue that Judas is the one. You know, I could fool my dad sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, and get out of things, but I can't fool Jesus. And it's interesting that Jesus, when he says, one of you will betray me, the disciples know that he knows all about them. He knows their past. He knows what they've done. Peter is probably thinking at the time, well, is it me? I was the one that challenged him about going to the cross. And he said to me, get behind me, Satan. Is it me, maybe? Maybe James and John were thinking, we have a fearful temper, and Jesus has seen that temper at times. Is it us? Is it our hot nature? Maybe Simon the Zealot was saying, is it because I hate the Romans so much? Or maybe Matthew was saying, I had a bad history as a, as a tax collector. And all of them could have knew, could have seen into their backgrounds. All of them would have known that Jesus knew, and he knew them well. He knows each of us. He knows he can look deep into the secret chambers of our hearts. He knows our faults. We might have a need to be recognised. We might have a thin skin and we're easily, easily offended. We find it difficult to forgive. We're envious of other people and their successes. We give in to our lustful hearts. I don't need to go on, but I know that every time Jesus, God, somebody came into touch with Jesus or with God, there was an acknowledgement of their sinfulness and the greatness of God. And so the question they had was, is it I, Lord? Am I the one? And the bread goes to Judas. People say, why did Judas betray Jesus? I don't know. But I do know that Jesus gives the bread to Judas and later on Jesus shares the bread with his disciples. The sharing of bread was given to all the disciples. Judas chose to take it and go. But was this Jesus' last plea to Judas? The bread is offered and still he betrays. The bread is offered. The heart of Jesus goes out and it says he is deeply moved. I remember one day when I was teaching, I uh, came across a student who was sitting there having lunch and every occasionally he would slap himself on the leg. <laughs> and I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I've got a girlfriend. And he said, I, I want to be true to her. And every time I perv on another girl, I get angry and I slap myself on the leg. And it occurred to me that probably if I was his age, I'd be doing that every 20 seconds. <laughs> and I would be feeling the guilt of that because I grew up in a church that reminded me all the time of my sinfulness. And I grew up seeing Jesus as that great judge saying, one of you will betray me. And me saying, is it me, Lord? But somehow in the Gospels, as I went through them, in John 3, 17, I found this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. That's not to say that Jesus will not judge us, that Jesus will not convict us, but it is to say that his overriding passion for us is love. And as he loved each of his disciples, I wonder if his heart is breaking as the bread is passed to Judas. You see, Jesus will do anything he can to rescue you. He will even go to a cross. He's not blind to our faults, but he's not blind either to the extent of his love for us and the possibility of our love for him. We might be sinners, but in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. People sometimes say to me, Russ, what is the measure, the real measure of a person's life? And I always answer, the amount that they loved. 
That to me is above all. How much they loved is the measure of a person's life. And in this intimate time when Jesus is with his disciples and he knows he will be with them not much longer, he gathers them together and he says, I want to share with you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I find that an intriguing thing because of one word there and that's the word new. <laughs> Why does Jesus say a new commandment? When really in the whole three years he's been on about love. I believe it's because Jesus has taken them on a journey. A journey from being self-centred men to being lovers of men. And the first step of that journey is when he stands up and says, love your enemies. And I can picture the disciples saying, what? <laughs> you can't be serious, Jesus. How can you love your enemies? And so they go through that process of learning to love their enemies. And then it's almost like Jesus pulls them aside and says, love one another as I have loved you. It's another level up. How can you love someone as much as you love yourself? And the reality is I don't think we can. Jesus calls us to the impossible. And you probably think, well, you can't love any more than that. And then he gets them together and he says, I want you to love as I have loved you. Are you prepared to go to your own cross for not just the people you love, but sometimes the people who reject you? And that's the message of Easter. The message is the message of the extent of God's love. Just as Jesus reached out that bread to Judas, he offers us the bread of life. We can take it and leave, or we can stay and grow. Let's pray. Loving God, you shared your last supper with these disciples, but you would only go to your suffering alone. Alone, but for us. In your hurts, we share the benefits. But there are some who refuse to, to share, some who reject you, some who are impartial to you, some who are nonchalant or non-committal. Lord, we pray for those who choose to take the bread and go. We pray for those who even refuse the bread. And so at this time of Easter, we pray for those who oppose you, who would crucify you, who would challenge you and who would abuse you. We pray that they might catch the glimpse of your tremendous and incredible love, that their hearts would be softened and they would join the cries of those who shout Hosanna and yes, he is risen indeed. Amen.